much. Okay, so we have a, a panel right now. First, I want to thank to a few people who help us uh, to write a question, to Serge Rosenblum from the Weizmann Institute, to Shai Georgi from the Technion, to Nadav Katz from the Hebrew University, to Shlomi Kotler from the Hebrew University, and to Ronen Raz. And uh, we will start with the first question. Uh, it will be Ilana, Jay, Chad, Jan, and Matt. So Ilana, what are, in your opinion, the biggest two challenges in scaling up 2,000 of qubit, million of qubit, and what are the potential solution? Yeah, of course, it's a, it's a fantastic question and the one that we're all trying to answer, right, is to get that scale quality and control in place. Um, specifically, that we need to make sure, I think what Chad was just talking about there in terms of yield and making sure that we can have at that level effective qubit yields with Joseph Junction statistics that are are robust and uniform and, and uh, I think Jay also spoke about um, the need for um, uh, modularity potentially there as well being something that was interesting. The other piece around control electronics, making sure that we can control superconducting circuits in, in effective ways, especially cost effective ways that will require multiplexing. There is still fundamental physics to be done at different components here. Elena, specifically, I mean, you mentioned the, the three-dimensional architecture that you have. Do you think that the, there's any prospects of coupling qubits via the third dimension? Yes. And that would help, somehow this help uh, we, scaling? Yeah, this is something we've actually already demonstrated as part of this, an Innovate UK project partnered with CQC a few years ago. So you can start to then create 3D arrays, um, which is, is fun as well. And with modularity, you can have coupling on a different level and then start to interconnect um, in a really neat way as well. So plenty of flexibility uh, with the coax bond for that. Okay, uh, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, uh, Jay, can you answer, please? Can you please answer the question? What is in your opinion, the biggest two challenges? Jay, you're muted. Now. Yeah. Biggest two challenges? Yeah. Um, uh, coherence will always remain and material science will remain something that we have to keep uh, investigating. And uh, as I said in my talk, um, I'm confident we'll get to order a thousand qubits, uh, how we connect these ones together in meaningful ways where we have uh, uh, the same fidelity and make modularity is a, is a challenge. So um, if I stay on the hardware, those are the two. Ultimately on the um, on the software, it's finding efficient quantum circuits that can work in the near term uh, to provide a computational uh, advantage over classical computing. Thank you. Chad, what do you think? Uh, I, I think it's ultimately gonna be about what I call performant yield. Um, we can go put a thousand qubits on a, on, on a wafer or a die, or you could put you know more they need to all be operating within spec, you know, no, no TLS defects or, 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 or within, within the, the acceptable parameters, highly coherent, no, you know, no errors, uh, you know, manufacturing issues and defects. And that's going to be a challenge going forward. And it's not a physics, you know, the physic, physics understanding and material science understanding can certainly plays a really, really big and important role in that. But ultimately it's got to, bring in aspects of, of manufacturability and, and, and materials engineering and um, problems of the semiconductor industry ha has been focused on solving for, 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 for many decades. So I think yield is going to, performance yield is going to be a challenge. One of, the, one of the comments I would make along those lines is typically one of the most important factors is to manage complexity at the individual component level. And uh, the most sensitive components from everything we've seen um, in this field are the Josephson junctions themselves. And uh, I, I would encourage folks to kind of measure complexity by how many JJs are in your circuit, um, not necessarily how many, how many quantum modes those JJs are actually being used to represent. Because uh, ultimately the, the, the really reliably manufacturing those, the barriers in the Josephson junctions is probably gonna be one of the key challenges. Okay. Okay, thank you. Jan, it's your turn. Yeah, let me maybe also bring something new to the table that maybe also was mentioned in, in John's talk, uh, which is about the 
calibration and benchmarking and doing this in a continuous fashion, because at least for the superconducting circuits, we know that we see, for example, fluctuations over time. So this means that at least we have to, to check from time to time and how to implement all of this in a, in a scalable software. I think this is going to be a challenge um, as well if we really want to scale up the system and keep it operating. Okay, thank you. Math, what do you think? Thanks. Yeah, I, we, everyone's made some really good points. I mean, I would resonate with Alana's point that that solving the kind of I/O problem and the control problem of of scaled quantum computing systems is is I think the biggest challenge that we need to cost effectively and robustly control uh, large qubit arrays. Um, and the best way to do that is is with high multiplexing and 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 in our case on chip uh, digital digital quantum logic. Uh, digital classical logic to control it um, and also this modularity aspect that that again there's going to be a yield issue as as Rigetti pointed out that, that you can only make so many qubits of, of a good quality on a system so you need to start um, multiplexing them to get multiplexing different chips together and all of that is is you know really robustly understanding how you can integrate systems um, at the chip level okay thank you we will move to the next question, Nathaniel. You are on mute. Thank you. Uh, right. So, so, so the next question is, um, you know, um, how much of your team's attention has shifted to device characterization and device theory over the past few years? And, and how close are we to the point where, you know, using classical computers to characterize a quantum device is no longer possible? Um, so, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe Chad, do you want to take that question first? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, characterizing devices is one of the predominant activities of any, needs to be one of the predominant activities of any quantum hardware focused operation. So obviously it's a, it's a thing we're, we're, we're heavily focused on. Um, theory, I would say uh, we, we have an effort. Uh, we, we, we have you know, a, a very strong theory team um, and it, you know, it's been uh, growing uh, uh, over the past few years, but I don't think has 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 profoundly changed in proportion of our operations. Um, the The second part of the question uh, is is interesting. I would argue that we're already at the point where certain quantum computers are not, you know, certain processes on quantum computers are not effectively simulated. Obviously, the Google supremacy demo demonstration is an example of that. But that's not really what I mean. Um, things like uh, to do effective algorithm design and to solve the problem Jay mentioned about you know what are some efficient quantum circuits that that can be leveraged to create a computational advantage. Um, designing those in the presence of practical noise models is important, um, and understanding those noise models and simulating circuits in the presence of practical noise models is already very, very challenging for classical computing if, if you start to include all the, all the noise channels that are there in the real physical systems. And so from that practical perspective, that's one of the reasons why the primary use case of today's kind of hybrid NISC era machines is pr pr practical algorithm design. So we're kind of already encroaching into, into, that, into that territory on that front. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, thanks, Chad. So, so yeah, uh, Jan, do you want to uh, answer that question next? Yes, I think and these were, were very good points. And um, I think that everyone, as I said, should put a lot of effort in the characterization. But I guess here the goal is also to automate it more and more over time so that the human resources will be less and, and more can be done programmatically. And I think then the, the challenge really is about these noise models. So usually one of the first questions I get is always, which noise, noise model are you using? And, and I think putting um, this in, into the um, characterization of the overall performance, um, this is something that's quite complex and, and still some questions I think are not fully understand. So I guess here, this is also a nice topic where we can really still benefit from the interaction with the scientific community and take into account what they are producing um, and, and then take these findings and try to apply them to the data that we collect in our um, benchmarking routines. Okay, um, so uh, Matt, do you wanna? Uh... Yeah, I follow exactly with Jan's point that, that a lot of what we do at the moment is benchmarking characterization of, of lots and lots of devices, um, but that needs to move towards an automated approach because ultimately 
the human, you know, we can't have lots and lots of people just doing characterization. Um, and then in the in the benchmarking side of things, yeah, we're all we're already at that limit where it's classically difficult to benchmark systems. Even a five qubit chip is is classically challenging to, to do process state tomography on. Um, so so yeah, we need to we need to be including these noise models into the analysis. We need to be thinking about uh, you know how you can applicate you know benchmark a system against applications rather than just arbitrary two qubit and single qubit gates. Um, and and there's a lot of work to be done there. And and I think the best approach is 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 kind of the approach a lot of our companies are taking, which is to work with the customers, with the end users, uh, to really you know model out how they're going to work with quantum processes and how they want to benchmark a, a quantum system. Um, so I think that's that's the takeaway message here. Where you know use these NISC devices to to understand how how we should benchmark against applications. Okay. Um... So Jay, uh, do you want to answer next? Sure. Um, so I think theory is and will always be fundamental. Um, I wouldn't think it's going to be disappeared. I think if you're in this field, get ready to go to ridiculously high orders in perturbation theory <laughs> and, and things like this to understand what's going on. Um, for calibration, I have a different approach than most, and, and that we've always looked at it systematically into three fundamental different things. One is spec parameters that depend on the physics of the device. These are easily automated. Examples include T1, T2, S and R. Then you have a set of parameters that very much depend strongly on the human, like some type of calibration. These are the gate fidelities, readout fidelities. These um, can be reasonably automated and we've been automating this for a very long time. Um, I like in those ones to separate how you measure it from how you tune it so you don't create an issue. And then thirdly, we have on top holistic system uh, metrics. And uh, I think many of you have probably heard the quantum volume one that we, as one of the ones that we push, but these represent how a system performs on whole. So we try to separate it into those three. We call it a pyramid. All our devices first easily screen and get the specs. The calibration is all automated and the quantum volume still requires a little bit of people's uh, time to optimize. All right. Um, right. In terms of theory, let's just keep in mind that QED is an asymptotic series. What's this here, Asif? And Ilana right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's okay. I don't have too much to add. Um, what everybody has said is super interesting. I echo most of it. We also have team working on um, this ourselves and of course automated systems of this as well. I think um, making sure that I think to Matt's point, um, algorithmic and algorithmic benchmarking and, and trying to find smarter, more user focused ways of doing that is definitely something that we're also keen on. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have much more to add than that. Okay, so maybe you will start answering the next question is, in your opinion, will NISC system has useful application in the near future? If yes, please elaborate. I am a NISC believer. <laughs> 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 no, I think that uh, NISC and especially when you can start to uh, co-design um, as well with um, hardware and software, again, something that Quaxmon can do very flexibly because we don't have to build end to end, we can start to do connectivity quite quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we work closely with uh, quantum software companies uh, to identify these specific near-term applications um, and start to map them onto the system requirements. And certainly it's something from all of our research, um, we're very excited about. Um, I don't think that the order of magnitude of say commercial impact of course it's going to be the same as once we hit fault tolerant points that will of course exponentially increase but um i am i'm a nice believer hey uh, jay can you answer sure um i have no idea what the word nisc is to be perfectly honest <laughs> i will never use it and i uh think it is a bad thing that we've done to the field to me we as a field have always been pushing quantum circuits and we've been pushing the quality capacity, like how good, how do we make them better and better? How do we make them run faster and faster and what types we can run? Error correction is fundamental for continuing this path. 
and um, error mitigation is something to do. But um, I'm interested in understanding which circuits um, are hard for us to do and then how we can map them to applications. And uh, we've investigated two different flavors that I think are promising. One is for chemistry using hardware efficient circuits and the second one is for quantum kernel estimation. And uh, we put a paper out yesterday that generalized it to groups with structure. And I, that one's my favorite at the moment, but it still comes down to the keep making quantum circuits with higher quality and capacity and do whatever you can to achieve that. And NISC I think has created a thing that we're going to have to undo over time. Okay, thank you. Jan, do I, I can I can pick this up and let's assume that building a an error corrected machine is a useful task, then can it already be useful for these um, NISC or near-term machines to help us doing this and accelerating doing this? So I think this is the um, at least one of the values that they add the learnings that we get from these because the other strategy would be that we say, okay, let's build right now an error corrected systems and put millions or whatever qubits on the chip without doing this intermediate step. And I think the kind of educational um, value that these near term devices give us um, shouldn't be underestimated. Also then the education um, for more um, experts in the field, because I think we are all a little bit at least suffering um, from the low availability of, of good people. And I think we can use um, these near term devices also very nicely to educate then the next generations of talent. So this is the least value I would give to these devices. And then, I mean, you saw my presentation. I also think that there might be one or two applications out there that um, add value with these near-term devices. Okay, Chad? Um, <laughs> I mean, Jay, Jay raises a good point that NISC is not really a well-defined term. And uh, if you take it to mean, you know, not fully fault tolerant and not fully error corrected, um, or uh, that then, you know, you just kind of put the bar there, then yeah, I, I think there's gonna be, there's gonna be, there, there certainly is the, a realistic possibility of useful problem solving before you've got full general purpose, universal fault tolerance for sure. And I mean, I think the, the, the proof is gonna be in the pudding, but the evidence in favor of that belief continues to grow over time. And there's just so many smart people working on that problem at this point. It, it's, you know, it, it's likely to continue. I, I think it's likely to continue that, that progress what degree of error correction is going to be needed? You're going to need some, and, and just how much, and, and how well, and how far below threshold for the how much error correction you're doing, it all remains to be seen. And this is incredibly hard to do these calculations and to do this theory work, and it's it's extremely important as well to, to understand that clearly. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I, I, I guess I think the difficulty of NISC, it's more like we think about what's what's available, what's going to be available in the near term, but the difficulty of quantifying it and describe, defining it as a NISC suggests that there's going to be a boundary of a NISC system and then there's a fault tolerance system. Um, and that boundary is, is I think, dangerous to define because it's going to be a, a, a progression from what, from noisy systems to you know, error mitigated systems to error corrected systems, and there'll be application unlocked at each step. And, and as the, you know, as, as Jay was saying, as, as quantum circuits become more and more powerful, uh, we'll be able to do more with them. Um, and, and, you know, noisy systems will run shorter quantum algorithms. Um, but, but still, you know, at the end of the day, NISC exists, it's a word, and it's near term systems, you know, have a, a strong potential to, to deliver value. Um, we, we, I think we, as a group, we all know we have a good idea about what area that those applications might be in quantum chemistry and, and, and the likes, um, and, and have a, have a, you know, optimization elements. Um, but, you know, really it's going to be in our view, very application specific and, and you're going to have to work very closely with the application and the, and the person that wants to get quantum advantage uh, or the team, you know, the team that want to get quantum advantage to really draw out that near term potential. Thank you. Nathaniel? Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, the ne next question, I think, uh, you know, it resonates with uh, many academics. Um, you know, in, in light of this uh, huge investment in, in the quantum computing industry, uh, what, do you, what do you think uh, is the role of the academic research you know, in this uh, arena of you know, quantum computing and superconducting quantum computing in, in 
particular. Um, okay, so so Matt, do you want to start? Uh... Yeah, it's a great question, um, and I think it's it's it was partly answered in one of our first questions about there's a lot of there's a coherence is is ultimately going to be the limiting factor of of gaining better and better quantum systems, um, and we and we need to get better coherence, and that's partly a material science problem. Um, and a challenge. So, so I think that's where a lot of, of academic work can play in really enhancing the material science of these systems and understanding that um, and, and doing that in more complex architectures um, as, as the industry evolves. Um, and also in, in the kind of academic theory side of, of, of application development, algorithm development, there's a lot of, lot of low hanging fruit and, and solid works that needed there. Um, and and also in, in novel types of, of new new qubit geometries. So so we're all here familiar with kind of the transmon. Um, but but what what is there a you know we've already seen emergence of new advanced types of qubits that have uh, some kind of protection uh, that give you better error rates. Um, but but what are the what you know what are they going to look like over the next uh, three to five years and longer? Right. Uh... Jay, do you want to take that next? I, I think that was very well said. Um, high risk, high reward, and academic is fundamental for progress for quantum computing to continue. Okay. Um, um, right, now, Jan. I, I also totally agree. And I think as, as many of us, um, I, I made the transition from academia um, in um, onto the other side. And now I'm, I'm running a company and basically I feel the constant time pressure as, as many of us and milestones. And we don't have any more this kind of time to sit down and really think about the important problems. Um, and, and I think this is something um, where we will see a lot of great breakthrough ideas still coming from the scientific world, which then um, help all of us in, in um, bringing the field forward. So I think, yeah, we, we cannot underestimate the, um, the importance of the academic and, and scientific um, players here. And um, in, in the end, um, at least in, in our view, it's an ecosystem thing. And we really try to be very closely entangled uh, with the academic players um, and, and try to solve these big challenges together. Uh, okay, yeah. So, so Elena, do you wanna take that? Yeah, of course, there's a spin out from the University of Oxford. Um, right there, the academia plays a really important role um, in the development of, of and the success of the, the industry in the future. Um, I'd echo everything everybody has already said. I would flag, um, we're getting a few reoccurring themes now um, out from academia that they're struggling to find postdocs, which is going to then impact on new novel ideas and IP development that can then feed into industries. So um, that, of course, comes down to the skill shortage. Uh, companies are hiring for academia also needs to make sure it has a supported talent pipeline um, and also around funding um, so we're also now seeing less funding potentially going into um, into this specific area where more funding potentially from government is going into commercialization of quantum technologies as opposed to early stage research and I think that's something that we all need to play a role in making sure that we keep an eye on because whilst it might be a short-term benefit for us the long-term gain for us individually, but also the sector, um, it's really important that that um, remains a healthy ecosystem and environment for future success. All right, uh, Chad. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I I can't state enough how important uh, the health of the academic research community is to the overall success of, of the of the industry and of the field. Um, it, it's important for universities to hire and fund faculty in this area. It's important for to be able to, you know, pay competitive salaries to graduate students and postdocs. Um, it's all just incredibly important. I also think going forward, the there, there's just going to, I don't think anything's going to stop in terms of opportunities for academic research. I think the types of problems that can be addressed to the challenge is going to become enriched. And, and informed a little bit by some of the systems integration and scale up efforts that will tend to ultimately happen in, in larger organizations like national labs or, or industrial players. Um, and I, I think you're gonna start to see, uh, 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 you know, a, a very rich, uh, a very rich progress coming out of some of the academic groups on at the qubit level of technology, as well as, you know, into material science 
and then sol beginning to solve some of these problems of really understanding the performance of partially and fully error corrected systems at scale on practical use cases um, is this, it, there, there's so many open questions in the industry today and, and many of those are best solved within the academic research community. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. We will move to the last question. Yeah, there is a last question. Uh, you are standing at the head of the pyramid. What type of problems keep you up at night and you would like to see them solved in the near, in the near future? Uh, Jay, if you can start, it will be great. Uh, Sorry, what was the question again? Okay. Uh, what type of problems keep you up at night and you would like to see them solved in the near future? Can I say all of them? <laughs> <laughs> Choose one, yeah. I, I think um, I'm excited by the concept of uh, dynamic circuits and trading classical and quantum resources. I think error mitigation, which we showed was a start, but I think there's a lot more that can be explored there. Simple, we know statements like Clifford's can be done in constant depth if I can feed forward. We know that uh, we can mix Clifford's and non-Clifford's now to get some improved uh, fidelity and estimating observables. I think this whole area of how I trade classical and quantum to achieve something that is better than the parts is an extremely uh, ripe area for investigation. And you're going to need quantum machines and tools to test this. OK, thank you. Chad? Uh, I, I think if I could wave a wand and solve one problem, it would be we, we need a, a clear, unambigu unambiguous specification of a system that would conclusively and not controversially show strong quantum advantage for a commercial application. And, uh, and something that isn't a worse case lower bound requirements, but kind of addresses some of the, you know, um, a, a practical set of requirements to that so that the, 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 the broader ecosystem can understand truly where we need to get in, in order to, to unlock that. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, tough question. Um, a lot keeps me awake at night, but um, <laughs> they, I guess you know, two, two, two key, I think, challenges that the industry is facing moving forward is, is, is the skill shortage that has been mentioned a, a number of times that, that, you know, we don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to hire lots and lots of people, but we do need to hire good people and retain that talent. Um, and so, so, you know, we need to get access to, to, to good people and, and ultimately, you know, a skill shortage means, salaries go up and then it becomes challenging for new startups to get in and 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 pay a fair wage so so i think that's that's one key thing and and ultimately you know uh, the risk of of hyping quantum computing technology um we need to mitigate that risk that that you know everyone we need to be as a as a as a group very realistic about what we say in the public media um about what what quantum computers can do okay Ilana? Yeah, thank you. I think just continuing from what Matt said there about hype, I think that ties really nicely into what Chad was saying. And if there was a more concrete roadmap of examples and system requirements that as an industry we could head for, that would mitigate against some of the hype where right now a lot of applications are still kind of quite speculative and having more concrete examples and systems requirements would be super helpful. Um, again, a lot keeps me up at night. Um, this is a huge responsibility. We are pioneering a field together. We are pioneering the birth of an entire industry and a huge amount rides on that. Everything that we do today um, will help create the future <laughs> and it, the future will be built off the technology and the, the way the people that build the technology today will be reflected within that. Um, so for me, making sure that we're all taking a step back and, and also acting ethically, making sure we're considering the broader picture as well as just building you know, this incredible technology. We can all get very excited, of course, um, because it is the best thing um, since sliced bread, but um, that was such a British statement. Um, but my point is, is that um, I want to make sure we're building an inclusive, a diverse, 
a healthy industry and ecosystem and as leaders here we will have that responsibility and and that keeps me up at night <laughs> thank you jan you are the last one oh i'm the last one what keeps me up at night well usually <laughs> i sleep quite well even though i always have these very strong eye rings but that's not due to a lack of sleep um, but anyways um actually um so in this sense maybe um i i end with something positive or a hope that what i enjoy is that the community is so friendly and kind of collaborative with each other which i like a lot and and which we also like a lot in, in iqm and i hope it stays like this because we know all it's also a strategic field of technology and and there are many things going on in the world so i just hope that we um within the community keep this kind of friendly attitude um across each other and share as much as we are allowed to and, and can still the results because I think in the end everyone benefits from this. Okay. Hey. Thank you. It's yeah. good to see that you know at least kind of half of the audience survived till the end. <laughs> spectacular. Uh, so thank all of you. It was very interesting and it was a privilege to have all of you. Uh, thank you very much guys. Okay. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.